Hi Gold Coasters, it's Flair McDonald here. I'm just here to talk to you about the Shearer's Wife. It's all going to be back to front, sorry about that. But it's uh, just um, thanks very much to the Gold Coast Libraries for having me here today. You're probably wondering what the background is. Well, I'm in a shearing shed to talk to you about the Shearer's Wife. So um, my there's two there's uh, dual narratives to the, to this story. One set back in the 1980s, and Ian and Rose Kelly are um, a shearer and his wife, and they're transient. They go from shed to shed. Ian just loves the life on the road. He loves hanging out with the shearers and drinking rum and just having uh, having a great time. But Rose is not so happy about that. She's pregnant with twins, and she just wants to settle down and have a nice um, a nice lifestyle in with a nice home. We fast forward to uh, 2020, we go back into the town of Barker, which Detective Dave Burrows lives in, along with his uh, partner, uh, Jack Higgins. And they go, they make a crazy, the Australian Federal Police come in and make a, an arrest that neither Jack or Dave can understand. And so they're trying to work their way through that. But what I thought I would do first is take you on a little tour around the shearing shed. And I hope that you'll um, excuse the wind, the, uh, the sea breeze is here in Esperance. But what would have happened when Ian was, when Ian was uh, shearing is he would be shearing the sheep and the presser would have been putting um, the wool into bales like these. They would have gone into a great big press and squished down and uh, produced these bales. And then what would happen after before the sheep would be here in uh, this is what we call a catching pen. I'm not sure if you can see that catching pen. And uh, Ian would have pulled the sheep out from there and dragged it over to his stand. And when he'd finished shearing the sheep, there's a chute that goes down to the bottom out there that takes the sheep out to the yards. So um, that's a little bit about the shearing shed. We've got all sorts of animals and wool in the shearing shed. I don't know if you can see these ones up here, but we have some tiny, tiny little willy wagtail chicks. They're pretty cute, aren't they? Mum gets a little bit cranky when I come up into the shed, so if I get dive bombed, you'll know what's happened. So um, I've got some questions here from um, the Gold Coast Libraries. I'll just get them up. So but I'm wanting to know a little bit about the inspiration for, um, for the Shearer's Wife. So I'll just show you the cover again. Uh, so the Shearer's Wife, I've got a detective friend who lives in Perth and we catch up once uh, uh, once every six weeks or so and have a, have a chat, um, go to the pub and have a meal and just, and just have a chat about things. And writing the November book is always different to writing the April book when I'm doing, um, you know, the early Detective Dave Burrows series. And um, so the, these uh, Christmas books are, you know, the, the normal rural lit books that I started off writing back when I first wrote Red Dust. And I didn't want it to be a cliched book. I didn't want it to be a story that had been done before. And I really li like writing about things that are topical. And I read an article about a woman in, um, in Queensland who had been selling drugs to put her children through private school. And I thought that was a really interesting thought process, you know, doing something illegal for something good, a bit like, um, a, bit like a Robin Hood type scenario. So that really piqued my interest and I thought, well, I might be able to do something with that. So then I started writing the 2020 side of the narrative. But also then back in the 80s, which I don't know what you think, but I sort of think the 80s were only just the other day. But in fact, they've been 40 years ago and I've actually got the grey hairs to prove that. Um, th so it was still really easy to disappear then, like just head bush and change your name and nobody questioned you. It didn't matter if strangers turned up uh, into, into communities. And that's where I, as the more I started to research that, the more that I thought that we could have this, um, this dual narrative of 1980 and 2020. And you won't... There will be, um, it takes us, I'll just read the blurb, that'll, that'll, that'll be a bit easier. It takes a series of unconnected incidents in Zara's digging. Zara is my journalist that came, that started, uh, that appeared in Starting From Now. So her digging to reveal an almost forgotten thread of mystery and how these two events 40 years apart could be connected. So that's a, a little bit of the, about the inspiration of the book. I spent a lot of time um, 
you know, just sort of thrashing things out with Dave and, and um, with my detective friend, just talking about uh, how we can put it together and what type of um, investigation te techniques the police would use uh, in in a um, in a case like this. And we just have a lot of t a lot of fun throwing ideas around. And my detective friend also reads everything that I um, that I write before I send it in, just for authenticity. Because I think what makes um, what what makes a book a page turner is the authenticity about it. Those small things, those really small um, uh, features that you know are are right. I think that just sort of makes the book pop and lift off the page a bit. Um, and so the, uh, the Gold Coast Libraries are asking also about my life and the place that I like to work. So I've got I've got a fairly busy life. I write in, I write two books a year, and that's my main job. I also am the secretary for the Agricultural Society here in Esperance, and on the board of um, Australian Women in Agriculture, the WA rep for that. And I also, um, and I started a not-for-profit organisation called DV Assist. So DV Assist, formerly known as Breaking the Silence, is a, uh, a not-for-profit organisation that I started uh, a while ago to support people in rural areas experiencing family and domestic violence. It's a cause that's very close to my heart. And if uh, if you feel that you're experiencing family and domestic violence, if you just head across to um, dvassist.org.au, uh, we might be able to help you. I'd love it if we could. Um, so uh, places that I really like to write, <clears throat> I used to write in the wool shed a lot, um, the shearing shed, when I was uh, still working out on the farm. These days, oh, and I used to love writing in my ute uh, as I was shifting sheep, and uh, it just really helps you get the details right and the authenticity about everything, and, and I just really, I love doing that, loved being outside. These days, I tend to write a lot um, in my backyard, I've got a massive couple of massive big gum trees out the back, and it looks out over five acres. and And I find that I write better uh, when I'm outside. My my descriptions and my prose, my prose is better. Um, obviously, I've got to write inside during winter, and I usually do that with uh, my Kelpie Jack curled up at my feet, or the Jack Russell Rocket curled up at my feet. And I love doing that too. But I feel a lot freer outside. Um, so some of the other questions that uh, that the Gold Coast libraries have asked is one is uh, um, Dave Burrows and did I ever see that he was going to be such a fan favourite? I had no idea when I wrote Red Dust that he was going to be uh, he was going to turn into to who he has. So he he was a very strong character in Red Dust, and then as I went along, he featured um, briefly in Purple Roads, and I think he also featured in. Uh, in Crimson Dawn, I think. I might be wrong, but I think it was Crimson Dawn. And then when I went to write Emerald Springs, I suddenly realised that I had I needed a detective, but I already had a detective there, so I just brought him back in. So as we've gone on, Dave's backstory started to come through a little bit more. Um, we see him interact with his family that he's not really that keen on. And he's just this wonderful, flawed, but perfect character at the same time. He's... Um, I, I wrote a blog. Uh, I'm not sure how long ago now, but it was um, it was titled "If Dave Burrows Was Real, I Would Have Married Him Years Ago," and that was so what I would have done. I would have loved to have married Dave Burrows if he was real. Um, so, so I'm really pleased he's turned into the character that he has. But he's getting older, and I guess at some point we're going to have to think about retiring him. So I'm not sure how I'm going to go about that. But we've got Jack coming up behind, and I think he will make a good replacement in time. Um, so one of the other uh, the other um, questions that was here is what do I love most or and struggle with living in the country? There's very little that I struggle with. Um, there's always times that are tough. There's times that it hasn't rained or it's rained too much. Um, it's summer and the dust blows and uh, and it's spring and everything is um, and everything is beautiful. So there's very little that I struggle with. Um, I just really feel that this is what in the country is where I belong, where my soul lies. I love the Flinders Ranges, but I also really love uh, Esperance and the, um, the farm that I've got here, and that's yeah, this is where I want to be. So um, very little that I struggle with, but there's always tough times in, in, any, um, in any environment or any job that you're doing. 
Um, so how has my writing process changed over the years? Well, that's a really interesting question because it has changed. I didn't think that, uh, when I was sort of thinking about these questions, I thought, oh, no, no, it hasn't. But it actually has because when I first started writing, I was absolute pantser. I wouldn't plan anything. I'd just write. And I had the luxury of time to be able to... Um, you know, if, if I'd written myself into a corner, work through that, or if I had writer's block to be able to work through that. But writing two books a year, I don't have that, that time factor so or luxury. So um, I plan to a point. Uh, and then I, if, but I plan so much that I will be able to, um, you just have to excuse the noise, there's some sheep coming into the shearing shed. Um, so I plan to a point, but I plan with the thought process that something's going to change because I don't want I don't want you reading a book that you know what the ending is. I want you to want to turn every page until it's finished, and I think by planning, um, that tends to take that uh, la that excitement away. So I always plan with the intention that something will change, and you know, so I'm never ever locked in. Uh, and so how important are public libraries to me? Well, they're very important, very important. I've always been in and out of libraries ever since I was a kid. When I was um, in primary school, I spent most of my recesses, I was one of those nerdy kids that I spent most of my um, recess and lunch times in, um, in the library. And I can still remember my primary school library card, so 150V was my number. And then when I went to high school, I realise it's not a public library, but when I went to high school or boarding school, uh, I used to spend a lot of time in the library during lunch and recesses then as well. But, you know, public libraries are incredibly important. You know, mums that are taking their kids into story time and the people using internet in there. And, and it's a one-stop shop, you know, elderly people that are going in and borrowing a book. The, the librarian or the person that checks their book out might be the only, only person they speak to that day. So it, they're just incredibly important um, and I love libraries I love the smell of libraries and I love the atmosphere of libraries I just sometimes I walk in and I get goosebumps um, and there's one more question that I just have to check on and that's oh so what's next for Flair McDonald well that's a very good question too uh, so yeah, writing two books a year will keep me out of mischief. I'm contacted, contracted up until the end of next year. So uh, yeah, I've got three books to write between now and then. And hopefully, hopefully sometime next year I'll be able to get back on the road and get to Queensland and catch up with all of you guys because you, know, you know, we haven't been able to tour this year with um, things being so strange and COVID and everything. So uh, I'm really... Um, Really looking forward to be able to do that. Um, I'm still going to be involved with DV Assist, and you know I'm getting back out here farming again. It's been um, five, four years since I've been able to actually farm, and uh, I had a back injury which sort of stopped me um, from doing any physical work for a long time as well. But yeah, I've, I've got a farm again, and we're um, share cropping with um, with some friends, and yeah, I'm just really, really loving life. I'm, I'm incredibly lucky. I have a job that I love and um, a farm that I love and yeah I'm, I'm an incredibly uh, lucky person. So anyway that's about all from me. I'll just give another shout out to the Shearer's wife. Um, I hope that you'll enjoy it when you get to see it or get to pick it up and thanks so much for having me Gold Coast Libraries. It's really it's been fun. Bye. Mm -hmm.